What is thermal desorption used for and how does it work? Hi, I'm Kurt Thaxton. I'm the product manager for thermal desorption here at Gerstle. I travel the world and as a member of standards organizations, I talk to a lot of people, many of whom don't even use uh, thermal desorption or chromatography, a lot of biologists, a lot of people in air, air quality. So I get this question a lot, you know, so what, 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 what do you do with this thermal desorption thing and, and how does it actually work? So let's talk about that briefly. So what can you analyze using thermal desorption? Well, basically anything you can fit inside a thermal desorption tube. Uh, that's a whole wide variety of things. If you're into, interested in air quality, it would be a tube filled full of powdered sorbents uh, because you're going to sample air through that tube and, and concentrate it there. But that's not all, though. You can be doing things like thin film spemi, which is used to grab out trace compounds out of water for food quality or environmental purposes, or a similar technique, uh, twister or SBSE, which is used for the same. Actually, and the two put together are especially powerful for diagnosing off flavor and uh, environmental water problems. Um, also, you can put a microvial in a tube, and you can anything you can get into a microvial, liquids or solids, you can analyze directly this way. Uh, all we have to do is heat the tube, but before we do that, we'll put a transport adapter onto that so the auto sampler can handle it, and we'll take it from there. Thermal desorption is a two stage process. So, as I mentioned, we have a sample in a tube, we've got to start with that. Um, you're going to either put the sample in the tube, or if you're doing air analysis, you will have pulled air through that tube, typically a liter, and uh, gathered it there. Once that sample is on that tube, that tube is now placed in a thermal desorption system where it's leak checked and heat and flow are applied. Now, it's very important that flow can be, uh, at the, at the result, as that flow comes out of the instrument, can be done either split or split less, um, so I can get everything or just a fraction of it that I want. So once it's in the instrument, I'm going to heat the tube, apply flow, and I'm going to move everything off the tube onto this focusing trap. So they're focused here. But why we're we using a focusing trap? Well, the flow out of that the absorption flow is typically 50 to 100 mils a minute. Uh, the column flow is usually one mil a minute. So we've got to do some kind of adjustment here to handle this mismatch in flows. And this is how we do this. So once things are on the trap, then we can go into stage two, uh, which took a lot like stage one. <laughs> After the analytes gather on the trap, the second stage begins. The trap's now going to be heated very rapidly, and, and everything's going to pass directly to the head of the column. Again, either split or split less. This is really cool because you can run splitless, splitless for the highest sensitivity possible, or you can run a high split twice. The splits are multiplicative. You can get a 40,000 to 1 split ratio or higher this way. So a wide, wide, wide dynamic range of things. But most importantly, this approach and doing it this way with this geometry is simple. It's a straight sample pathway, tube to trap, trap to column, and it's very simple to understand, diagnose, and troubleshoot. So the end result of all of this the, is a great way, thermal absorption is a great way to get an easy, reliable, and full range of analytes into a GCMS. It's valve-free, no sample loss or gain. Uh, people often forget about that. Uh, if you have things that get stuck in that valve, you'll be seeing them sample to sample. The easiest way to solve the problem is to remove the valve, which we've done. Um, you can run cryogen-free and still get the full range of analytes. Propylene to perylene, C3 to C40, 40, 40, 45, 50, whatever your column can handle. We can do all of that and without cryogens. Or if we're doing unknown work, we can actually use cryogens on purpose because if we trap on glass beads or glass wool, it's non-selective and I don't have to worry about which trap to use. So it's very, very powerful which way we want to run it. As an end user, it's very easy to troubleshoot. You can change the entire sample pathway. Think about what that is. That's the tube, the focusing trap, and maybe the first couple centimeters of the column. You can change all that yourself in just a couple of minutes without a service call, without the charges from that service call, and more importantly, without extensive downtime. This, is, this method of doing thermal desorption is totally compatible with all standard methods, including TO-17, ISO 16000 Part 6, uh, HJT-400, and several others. Um, I'm on a number of standards, standards committees, and I can speak for this personally. It's a very powerful technique and is used a lot in standards. But most of all, it's easy to understand, it's not complicated, and it's a great way to train. You know, once you use it a few times, because it's so simple, you can, you can become the trainer and you can train your lab staff this way. So thank you for your time. If you need more information, you have questions, please reach out to us at the contact information, and uh, I'm happy to get, get your questions. Thank you.